morning, good morning. Come on in. So uh, I think summer's happened, huh? It finally got kind of hot outside. So I want to remind everybody to go ahead and silence your phone. I'm doing that right now. Uh, that way we don't have to answer your phone calls for you. So I, I do that with the youth. If something rings, I have to answer it for them. I put it on speaker and the microphone. Um, so it's great that we could be here and, and worship together. Um, you know, we don't have to worry about persecution from the outside like a lot of our brothers and sisters in Christ this morning. Um, that they, they've had to deal with that already. And um, so it's great that we're, we're here in a nice, spacious facility and we're able to gather again. So, so let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we pray that we can now focus our, our minds and our hearts on you. Heavenly Father, we pray that, that we would not just worship you with, with words, but actually with, with all of us, with who we are. God, please teach us as we look into your word, and we pray that you would give us words of wisdom, things that we could obey wise man that builds his house upon the rock rather than someone that also listens but just doesn't obey. So God, we thank you for uh, Cindy and for Trinity and for what they mean to the church. And God, we pray that you would put your hand of protection upon us this morning. We pray it all in Christ's name. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. It's so good to be able to worship with you today. If you would, please go ahead and stand with us and we will get this service kicked off.
you do that this morning, no matter what's been placed in front of us, no matter the difficulty of life that maybe this week brought, Lord, may the attitude of our heart always be to run to you. You are a safe place. You are the captain of our salvation, Lord. You are a strong and mighty tower unto us, Lord. And even though the enemy comes with a flood, and his desire is to rip faith from us, to tear us down, and to keep us from being the glorious children that you've called us to be, Lord, we know that the enemy quakes in terror at you. Lord, we invite you amongst us today. And Father, my hope and my prayer is that we truly connect with you this morning. We let go of everything else. You've been so good to us, Lord. May the attitude of our heart be one of true praise and worship this morning. We love you. God, we lift this up to you in the name of Jesus.
to say hello to each other, so whatever that looks like for you. So, so um, good, that, good thing we have a little bit more space. Isn't it? So what we're going to do is we're going to say hi, say God loves you to um, 85 to 90 people this morning. So you might have to double up. So begin. All right, man, you guys would go ahead and gather back this way. What a joy it is to be here today, man. It's awesome hearing your voices, hearing you guys laugh, hearing you guys worship. Oh, man, there's nothing quite like that to me. So thank you so much for uh, expressing your heart to the Lord, joining us in worship this morning and seeking and pursuing after him. Um, so... Um, I want everybody to uh, try as best as you can to give me some 
full attention for just a second because I have kind of a, well, a couple of somewhat exciting announcements. Um, so we're entering into uh, really phase two of opening back up church. Um, as you guys know, we started our church services back a little bit earlier than most people just because of the space that we have, which was a huge blessing to us. But one of the things that being a church that is so community driven and that loves one another so much, it's been a hard thing not to get together with you guys as much outside of here. So um, I just want you to know that we're putting those steps back. Uh, we're actually going to have dinner or dinner. We can do dinner too. Um, we're going to have lunch today again, like we used to every after every Sunday service over at Mark and Amy's house. So if, uh, if you have the availability to be there today, please come. If you feel as though you're just not ready yet, um, you still want to kind of maintain social distancing, don't feel bad about that. But the option is there for you again to come, and we may go out and uh, share the gospel with some folks afterwards as well. And um, additionally, we are also going to start another life group soon. Um, so I don't know if you saw my uh, very inconspicuously placed table right there when you first walked in. We have a life group that's going to be starting up. And um, this is actually, we're looking at not making this semester driven, but something that's ongoing. So that's kind of exciting for me because we're going to have a kind of a church away from church. And the way that that's going to look is we're going to get together over at Chris and Leanna's house, and it's going to be every Thursday. Now, it's not going to start for a couple of weeks, so don't, don't show up there this week. I'm sure they would love to have you, though. But um, we're going to be getting together for the first time July 2nd. And on the paper, you'll see that it, we're going to begin at 6.15, and really kind of 6.15 to 6.30 is a bit of a buffer zone. I don't know if I should tell you all that. But uh, I, I will, I guess. That'll be a time just to get together and kind of have some snack food and catch up and all that. And really, 6.30 is when we'll kick off. I'll, we'll play a couple of worship songs. But really, the thing that's going to be uh, changing that I'm really excited about with it is we're actually going to be incorporating what we do Sunday with what we do on Thursday. And what I mean by that is uh, the message that we go through on Sunday. Like, for instance, today I'm going to be talking through the transfiguration of Jesus so what that would mean is if we were meeting this Thursday, but we aren't meeting this Thursday, but if we were meeting this Thursday, then we would talk about the transfiguration. We would go through these verses. We would really try to talk about how we take what we read and begin to apply it to our lives. Because remember, the mentality that I desire for us to have, the mindset that I want us to have is one of what does it look like to pursue Christ? What does it look like to intentionally begin to love this word so much that we begin to do it. Like everything that we're here, we're just, we have this insatiable appetite to put this stuff into practice. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that today as well. But again, sign up for small groups. It's gonna be great. If you miss a week, no big deal because you're not gonna miss one of eight weeks. You're gonna miss one of infinite weeks or at least until the Lord returns. So sign up come hang out with us. And also there's lunch afterwards as well. But let me go ahead and pray for us this morning. And we're going to turn our attention to God's word. Father, we thank you so very, very much for this word. God, there has been so much bloodshed, so much war, so much difficulty throughout history that this book arrives to us. And this gospel that sets men free arrives to us. So, Father, I pray that we look into this book as what it is this morning, not as just another book that's out there, but as the Holy Scriptures, the very words of God to us. Lord, I pray that that produces an excitement for us this morning and that we're excited, Lord, to be doers of the word. And, Father, this morning I also want to pray for any sickness that we may have in the body, any difficulties that are going on. Lord, we know that... Um, dealing with the brokenness of sickness and everything else is just something that we deal with in this life, but we're thankful we don't walk it alone. So, Father, we pray for divine healing. We pray that you would be the lifter of our heads, Lord, that you would bring comfort to your people. And, Lord, for those that are sick that are with us, Lord, we ask that you would quickly bring restoration to their body. And, Lord, for all the spiritual warfare as well that goes on within our body, all the difficulty that the enemy tries to bring against us, whether it's at our jobs, whether it's with our children, whether it's between spouses. 
Father, we pray that we would allow your word to penetrate our hearts. And Father, that your word would cause the enemy to scatter. We love you, God. We thank you for this opportunity to open your word this morning. And Father, to set our hearts to be intentional to do it. We love you and we thank you. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. All right, so we are back in our series that we've been going through for a while called Breaking Ground. And we're actually gonna be going through this through chapter 10. So you're gonna have to hear this uh, little monologue that I do every week for at least several more weeks. But remember, what Jesus is doing right now is he's preparing the disciples because through the disciples, he is gonna lay the foundations of the church that are gonna go vertical through the centuries and in which we are still benefactors of to this day. Now today, what's kind of exciting for us and what we're gonna see is an incredibly miraculous event that takes place that three of the disciples, Peter, James, and John, are gonna be witness to, and we get the benefit of being able to really take that in and to try to understand what all's going in. Now, we're only gonna be in, I think it's nine, uh, nine passages this morning, which isn't a whole lot, but I promise that you this, that buried within these nine verses is so much that we need to try to understand this morning. So I hope that, uh, I hope that you had some breakfast this morning and I hope you're ready to, to dive in. But I remember, um, I don't know about you guys, but does anybody have like cable TV anymore or is everybody just pretty much streaming TV now? Okay, I'm, oh, John, you have regular TV? Man, you dinosaur. Anyway, so... Uh, the reason I say that is back when I used to actually watch TV, which see, I, I don't even know if this was high school or early in my marriage, there used to be this show on, I don't know if you remember it, called Extreme Home Makeover. Now, this was an awesome show. They would like take this, was it at our house? Is it still a thing? So I don't watch network TV. I just you know, lay that out there. But anyway, back in my day, it's amazing I'm old enough to say that. Back in my day, when we would watch it, there was this guy, I think his name was Chad or Chaz or something like that. Wait, no, Chaz is a new zone in Seattle. His name was Ty. Yes, Ty Pennington. I was thinking Chad Pennington, the quarterback. Anyway, this is going to run off the rails quickly. But what would happen is this, there would be this house that was just this messed up house and these people would have a lot of need and um, Ty and his team would come in and just dramatically make over both the inside and the outside of that home. But there was always this one scene where um, the family would finally come. They hadn't seen the house up to this point. And there's this big bus that's in front of them and the family's behind it. And what would Ty say? Driver, move that bus, right? And it would move. Then all of a sudden, the faces of the people seeing their house for the first time, the tears would flow. We, we might be crying at our house. It was just a beautiful moment. Well, what we're going to see this morning is that on a cosmic scale, the greatest reveal in all of history. In fact, the unveiling of the glory of Jesus Christ is going to be literally seen by the disciples today, by three of the disciples. Now, up until this point, think about it. The disciples, they've wondered if Jesus is the Messiah. They've gotten to a place of thinking that Jesus is the Messiah. They've gotten to a place where Peter has now confessed that Jesus is the Messiah. And not only that, but there's been the affirmation of Jesus that he is, yes, the Messiah. But today, their faith is gonna become sight. For Jesus is gonna pull back the veil and reveal himself today in this glorious, amazing event that we call the transfiguration. So with all that being said, let's go ahead and jump into chapter nine and we're gonna start in verse 28. So um, it should come up for you on the screen if you don't have your Bible, if you do follow along with me. It says, now about eight days after these sayings, he took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. So that's kind of the, the entire event that takes place. We're gonna pick up a little bit more detail as we go on in the story. 
But um, the first thing that we find out is this is about eight days. Um, Matthew and Mark recorded as six, so Luke may have been taking the first and the last days and saying about eight. But this is an event that about eight days later, Jesus goes up the mountain to pray. So the first question I want to answer, or at least attempt to answer, because we can't conclusively answer it, is which mountain is he going up? Now, remember last week we talked about Jesus. He had moved his disciples into the region of Caesarea Philippi. And we talked about how that was incredibly significant. That Jesus takes his guys and goes to the far northern region of Israel to this place of Caesarea Philippi that was an incredibly wicked place. In fact, a a good rabbi that day wouldn't even allow a good Jew to go to that area because of all the wickedness. And we talked about how at the base that in the region of Caesarea Philippi was Mount Hermon. And at the base of that, if you guys remember, I showed you a picture of the cave that was there and that that was a place of not only Canaanite Baal worship, child sacrifice, but once the Greeks moved in, it actually became renamed as a place called Panaeus, where they worshiped the god Pan. This was a goat god that they believed that this cave went down into the underworld. So it was a gateway, if you will, to the underworld, which Pan would come up. There was all sorts of wicked things that happened there between um, sacrifice to uh, bestiality with goats. Just This was an incredibly wicked place, but it wasn't just evil in the mindset of the Greeks in this gateway that led to the underworld, but also even with the Jews. There were Jews that believed that this was a gateway in which the fallen angels in the days of Jared had come and descended upon Mount Hermon. And it's in this place that Jesus takes his disciples to one, say who he is, that he is the Messiah, the son of God to number two, say that he would suffer and he would die. Number three, that he didn't come to establish the kingdom at that moment, but instead he was building a new entity called the church. And guess what? The gates of hell would not prevail against it. Standing on the front porch of the enemy announces this and then says that these people who are gonna be called by my name are gonna be those that deny themselves, who pick up their cross daily and follow me. So this is a very intentional event. Now, up to this, in history, the most tradition is gonna point to the transfiguration actually happening on Mount Tabor. There's actually a church there right now called the Church of the Transfiguration. But there's, that viewpoint is a little bit problematic in history. And the reason for that is there was actually a, a militarized zone there by the Romans on Mount Tabor, and it's not all that huge. And not only that, but this was an area that the Sanhedrin They would light signal fires to announce the first sliver of the new moon that they would see, for instance, for the Feast of Trumpets. So this is a kind of an occupied zone, and it seems a little bit odd that that'd be the place that this private event that we're going to see happens today. So most scholars believe that it was actually Mount Hermon that Jesus went up, this very gateway that we were talking about, which makes this event, again, just such a dramatic event that takes place. So... I personally believe that it was Mount Hermon, but it's possible that it was Mount Tabor as well. We're just not really all that positive. But it goes on to say that as he was praying, this is the purpose by which Jesus went up there. He went up to the mountain to pray. And when that happened, his clothes became dazzling white, almost sparkling, kind of as if you were looking inside of a diamond. That began to happen. And actually, Matthew's account of this said that his face began to shine like the sun. So this is a crazy event that these men are seeing. And it's not as if something internally is changing in Jesus to where he's beginning to shine. Remember, Jesus is God. He has always been God. But that glory had been cloaked by his flesh. But for a moment, that is unveiled and the disciples see him in the glory that he's now in, of course, and that he appears to John in in the Isle of Patmos. So... Don't think of it as Jesus all of a sudden took on glory. Jesus has always been God. I think a lot of people look at this as a a great miracle, but in my opinion, this is almost the suspending momentarily of a miracle that had been taking place since the incarnation, since Jesus put on flesh. The fact that flesh could in some way conceal the glory of God is a greater miracle in my opinion. But for a moment, that gets taken away and his full glory is seen. Now, Luke is the only one that records that when Jesus goes up the mountain, he actually went up the mountain to pray. And I want to talk about that a little bit this morning because I feel, I believe that 
of all the spiritual things that we do, there's one that gets the back seat to everything that actually is the most important thing that we could put ourselves to. And that's a life of active prayer. Jesus said when he returns, would he find faith? And in context, he's talking about prayer. I, I want you to uh, think about this. The gospel says that we are sinners that have been separated from God. We've been born into this and we have no relationship with God. We can't have a relationship with God because God can't have a relationship with sin and we are sinners. Therefore, it says that we are under the wrath of God, that the wrath of God abides upon us. But that's the beauty of the gospel, right? That Jesus came, that he walked the perfect life that we couldn't walk. He died the death that we should have died and he has welcomed us into a relationship with the Father because he is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. So the thought that this holy God that cannot fellowship with sin has invited you and I before his throne to talk with them, to be with them, has got to be one of the greatest things that we can possibly conceive of. Do you know that it says that as we behold God's glory, like as we get to know this God, as we come to him, as we strive and we push to know him, which by the way, our, our relationship with God is such that we get to know about him in the Bible, but we get to know him in prayer. That as we're welcomed into this and as we go and as we behold his glory and we've, he begins to reveal himself to us, that that's the process that begins to bring change within our lives. And oh my goodness, when God begins to reveal himself to you, not just in the pages of scripture, but when you connect with God in prayer, it is absolutely life altering. I, I fear that there's so many in the body of Christ that we have not had that connection with God. And if there is anything that I can push you towards church and beg you, to do is not to neglect this thing. You have been welcomed before the throne of majesty. God is delighted to speak to you. That should cause us every morning to wake up and run into a, wherever it is you pray and to connect with him. And we can also, as we go up that mountain to pray, have a transformative effect on our life. Christ transfigures. And as we behold that glory, we also are changed as well. And if I could, let me repeat the same, same verse I quote so often, 2 Corinthians 3.18, that we all, as we behold his glory, we are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory to glory. I don't even know what to do with that other than to love it and to pursue it. Charles Spurgeon once said this about it. He said, prayer is the key of all mysteries. When Christ would unlock himself so as to let his disciples see his inner glory, he prayed. And this should teach us that if we would see Christ's glory, we also must pray. And if we would glow with the glory of Christ, like Moses when he meets with the Lord on Mount Sinai and he comes down and he's a glow. Spurgeon here says that if we are to be like that, if we are to have this inner glow with the glory of Christ, we must be in prayer. He goes on to say, these are practical truths of God, much more practical than many of us imagine. The active life, this life that we live, he says the active life will have little power in it if it's not accompanied by much of the contemplative and the prayerful. That is thinking about the Lord, meditating on the Lord, and talking to the Lord. There must be, he says, retirement for private prayer if there is to be any true growth in grace. That is so well said. I, I should have just stole those and said those are my words. But uh, Spurgeon Man, this is a man who knew prayer, who knew what it was like to meet with God. And this is God's desire for you, that you would meet with him, that you would know him, that you would grow him, that he would reveal himself to you. And oh, what a transformation that brings. And we go on from here. It says that after his, his clothing had become dazzling white, it says, and behold, 
Two men were with him, were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now, this is really neat for me because it's not as though when Peter and John and James see this, that Elijah and Moses are like, hey guys, I'm Moses, probably heard of me. This is Elijah over here. So in some way, in this glorified form, they just knew. And I love that because that means we won't be wearing name tags when we get into the kingdom. So we don't have to worry about when we're in the kingdom. Um, Connor, for example, putting some different name and trying to trick us all because Connor would do that. But um, instead, we're going to intuitively know those things, which is really neat to me that we're going to know. And oh gosh, when we talk about Christ, it says when we see him, we're going to know as we're known instant revelation at that point, and I look forward to those days. Now, imagine being a Jew in these days. Imagine being Peter, James, and John. Now, your entire life, you have grown up hearing about these men, these two heavyweights, these heroes of the faith. Man, these guys are rock stars to you. And all of a sudden, you've heard about Moses. You've heard about how God had chosen him. How God had used him to deliver the children of Israel from captivity, to give them liberation. How he met with God face to face on Mount Sinai. How God chose this man to deliver his covenant to him. What a huge component of who you are, even in your national heritage. And then Elijah, who Elijah, man, he battles on Mount Carmel. He battles with the prophets of Baal. Fire of God comes down at his prayer. Rain is stopped at his prayer. These men are heavyweights. And all of a sudden, you see them. Of these men that you have read about, these men that you've heard about, these men that you couldn't imagine being, you see them, you get excited, and then you realize something. They're paying homage to the one you've been following for two and a half years. And this is how close we're getting to the end, uh, towards the passion now. That these men, you realize in a moment, they're just like me. But Jesus is the one that they bend the knee to. So not only do you have the testimony of what you've walked with Jesus, you've you've seen his miracles, you've heard his teachings, you've watched him, you've come to believe that he's Messiah. He's even said it. Now you've seen his face begin to glow as he's unveiled. And now you have two witnesses from the Old Testament, the heavyweights of the faith. You can imagine that the disciples' faith have got to be soaring at this point. Now this comes right on the heels, by the way, of Jesus saying, the Son of Man is gonna suffer and he's gonna die. I can't imagine what a blow that must have been for these men who would have had the assumption that because Messiah is here, the kingdom age is gonna begin. That all of a sudden the nations of the world will bow before him. He's gonna overthrow the yoke of the Roman army and all nations will come to Jerusalem to worship. That was your expectation, but you just heard that he's gonna suffer and he's gonna die. And surely we'll talk about how the disciples may have been in sorrow at that point. But now they see this take place. They see Moses and Elijah. Unbelievable. These would be representations of the law and the prophets. Moses, the law, Elijah, the prophets. The law and the prophets testifying and being of witness to who Jesus is. Now, I want you to notice this last thing real quick. It says that, it said that they, a lot of times we have the tendency to think, man, I, I wish I was there. I wish I would have saw it. I wonder what they were talking about. Luke actually tells us what they were talking about, which is really neat. It says that they spoke to him of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now, a fun fact for you, this word departure in the Greek is actually exodus. They were speaking to him about the exodus. What exodus? the true exodus that was just about to take place. Now remember, in the early pages of the book of Exodus, we see a people in captivity. Just like you and I, we were, we were strangers to God. We were enemies of God. Rejected from the commonwealth of Israel, the Bible says. But when we look at the time of the exodus, this is the first picture of the sacrificial lamb. 
The picture where this lamb would be sacrificed, put on the doorpost to the home, and the angel of death would pass by. And this became a liberation point for the nation of Israel. And now Moses and Elijah are talking to Jesus about the true exodus, that what had happened in a very localized area there in those days in Egypt was about to happen on a cosmic scale for not just the Jewish people trapped in Egypt, but for all the saints of God that have been trapped under the tyranny of Satan for centuries. This is our exodus that we're seeing. And he's talking to Moses and Elijah about this very fact. I I find that so beautiful. And as we move on and we look at verse 32 through 33, it says, now Peter and those who were with them were heavy with sleep. But when they became fully awake, they saw his glory. And the two men who stood with him. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's good that we're here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah, not knowing what he had said. Now, the first thing that we see here is that the disciples were asleep on the mountain. And uh, this, is, this is a... This should draw our minds back to the same three guys when Jesus calls them to come and pray with them in the Garden of Gethsemane. What ends up happening there? They fall asleep as well. I don't know if you guys have ever been tired, but you wanted to pray anyway, and in your prayer, you ended up falling asleep. Same thing that happened to the disciples here, but actually Luke tells us why they fell asleep in Luke chapter 22. It said, because they were filled with sorrow. Now, when you take exhaustion and you combine it with sorrow and tears, that is a recipe for some pretty, pretty hard sleep. And remember, Jesus had just told the disciples that he was gonna die. I can only imagine that their hearts were broken for the Lord. They go up the mountain, they try to pray with him, but they fall asleep. But then all of a sudden, they became awake. And it says they became fully awake because they saw his glory. Now, this, is, this isn't like you and I waking up in the morning and it takes us a little while to kind of wipe the crust out of our eyes and get our eyes fully open. When you see an event like this, you are instantly awake. And that's what happened to the disciples here. And they see Moses and Elijah there. And then, and then Peter does something. Peter opens his mouth. It says, and the, as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's good that we're here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. Have you ever been in a situation to where you're kind of invited to a a discussion that people are having? You deem these people as somewhat important people and you're you're just, you're amazed that you even get to be there. And there's all this good discussion going on and you're like, man, I don't wanna just be a fly on the wall. Like I wanna contribute something to this conversation. And then all of a sudden you open your mouth and you realize what you said and you think, I'm just gonna go die now. Uh, y'all, y'all have a good day. So this is kind of Peter in this moment. He opens his mouth and says something, just not even understanding what he says. But we know this. We know that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? And Peter has already revealed his heart to us just six days to eight days prior. Remember when Jesus said that the Son of Man must die, what does Peter do? He rebukes the Lord, right? He says, not you, Lord. Lord. Far be it from you. And that's when Jesus has to equally rebuke Peter and say, get behind me, Peter. You're not mindful of the things of God. So we know where where Peter's heart is with this. Peter's heart loves the idea of the coming of the glory of the kingdom, the exaltation of what it's gonna look like now for the kingdom age to begin. But what Peter didn't like was the idea of the gore of the cross the death that was coming, the humiliation that was gonna happen instead. Peter was ready for the kingdom age to begin. And that's exactly what he's saying here when he says, Lord, it says as they were departing, like Peter does not want this event to end. He's like, oh, no, 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 let, let, let me build three tabernacles. And, and probably based on the timeline, the Feast of Tabernacles has taken place here. But the Feast of Tabernacles is also something that's related to the Exodus. So as the, children of Egypt, as the children of Israel come out of Egypt, remember, they have to set up tents as they're in the wilderness. And so in the, in the law, when Moses, he creates this feast day called the Feast of Tabernacles or Sukkot. 
And what they do is they build these little huts, these tents that they stay in, is to commemorate that time. So Peter is saying, let me, let me build these for you. See, Peter was ready for the true exodus to finally lead to the, to the end point, to the coming of the kingdom, to the promised land. In fact, you, you have to imagine that the disciples, there, there was a little bit of confusion for them, just like there's a little bit of confusion for us at times when it comes to the coming of the kingdom. Like that's a, that's a difficult subject the more and more you start reading it and Peter's having some difficulty with it as well. So as far as he, he knows, Jesus is gonna die, he's gonna rise again and instantly the kingdom age is gonna begin. But that's not what happened. Instead, we've been in this holding pattern for 2,000 years waiting for our king to return and he will return and the kingdom will come with him. In fact, after Jesus rises from the dead, it says this in Acts chapter one. It said he presented himself alive to them. This is after the resurrection, after the death. It says he presented himself alive to them, the disciples, after his suffering by many proofs appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And verse six goes on to say this. So when they had come together, they asked him a question. Jesus, we have a question for you. Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They, they didn't know even then. And like Peter must have thought, even back here at the Mount of Transfiguration, that they, the kingdom must be imminent. And what does Jesus reply to him? He said to them, it's not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But what does he tell them? But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. In other words, gentlemen, the kingdom is coming. But I have a role for you first. The establishment of what we call the church. This is still 2,000 years later, the marching orders for you and I, the people filled by the Spirit of God would go out into all the world and make disciples of the kingdom, that we'd go to the highways and to the byways, and for any who would desire to come in and to escape the wrath to come. That is our role as the body of Christ. Now, it's interesting in Zechariah 14, when it's talking about the coming of the kingdom, actually the Feast of Tabernacles is mentioned there. In verse 16 through 21, it says this, that the Jewish Feast of Booths, this Feast of Tabernacles is something that all nations will actually come to Jerusalem to keep. Isn't that interesting? Like the nations that move forward into the kingdom age, it says that those nations will come literally to Jerusalem and still celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. I find that pretty fascinating. So this idea is tied in with the coming kingdom. But I do want to, uh, I wanna read with you guys Matthew's account of the transfiguration, just a small piece of it because there's some additional information that he gives there that I really want us to look at. So Matthew 17, verse 10 through 13, it should come up for you. It says, and the disciples asked him, why do the scribes say that Elijah must come? And he answered, and don't forget this, Elijah does come and he will restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come and they did not recognize him. This is where it gets a bit confusing. He says, but did to him whatever they pleased. They ended up killing him, right? So also the son of man will certainly suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them of John the Baptist. Now you remember when the angel came and gave the prophecy to John the Baptist's parents or to Zechariah, he says that you're gonna have a son and he was gonna what? He was gonna come in the spirit and the power of Elijah. In other words, the task that he had was similar to that in which Elijah was called to do when he would restore all things. So this is a message of repentance. It's a message of national restoration. But what happens? Israel doesn't receive it, right? They reject John the Baptist and they kill him. And so also the same is gonna happen with the Messiah. But there's gonna come a point in history where Elijah does return. And actually Romans chapter 11 talks about how all of Israel at that point will be saved. 
And then the Messiah will come and he will establish the kingdom at that point. I want to read that to you in Malachi chapter 4, verse 1 through 6. Because this is what the disciples are talking about. I mean, the scribes are saying that Elijah must come. If you are the Messiah, if you are bringing the kingdom, where's Elijah? We, we just saw him. But why hasn't he restored all things? So many people are rejecting our message. This is what they went back to. Malachi 4, 4 verse 1 and 6. It should come up for you. And this is talking about that period of time at the end when the judgment of God falls upon this earth. When Peter talks about it, he says that it is a terrible day, that it is the day where the earth burns and the elements, they melt with a fervent heat. This is how Malachi says it. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. In other words, they will just vanquish quickly. The day is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall rise with healing in his wings. Isn't that beautiful? You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. I can't imagine a more joyful picture than that. And in verse four, he goes on to say, and he mentions Moses here. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and the rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all of Israel. And here's the verse, verse five. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with the decree of utter destruction. So what Malachi is prophesying here is that there is coming a day and dear Lord, it may be close. We don't know when this day comes that Elijah will appear before that great and terrible day. Now, most people believe that he is actually gonna be one of the two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11. Um, some of the signs of the waters turning to blood and rain not coming are in, they're similar to exactly what Moses and Elijah did. So some people think that even the Mount of Transfiguration was kind of a, a pre-tribulation meeting that happened as well. But I do, th I do hold the opinion that those guys are gonna be the witnesses of Revelation chapter 11 that will appear again in the last days. But it's Elijah who is gonna bring restoration to the nation of, nation of Israel apparently in a, in a large scale most of Israel is gonna repent and be saved at that point. And we believe that that's gonna happen during the time of the tribulation that the, the book of Revelation chronicles for us. So the last thing that I wanna mention about that again, since we're, we're tying in Exodus, we're tying in Elijah, here's just another little, little tidbit for you that you might find interesting. <laughs> Maybe not. But um, there was actually during the Seder, the Passover meal that they would do, there were some cups of wine that were there. And uh, these four cups of wine or five cups of wine represented something different as they would go through it. The first one, um, these are the promises of redemption that God gives. So the first one is that he would take them out from the suffering of Egypt. Number two, that he would deliver them from bondage. Number three, that he would redeem them with an outstretched arm and with great judgment. And number four, that he would take them to himself as a nation. And then the fifth cup, you may know it as Elijah's cup if you've ever done this. It's the one that corresponds to the future messianic kingdom of receiving the land. So what's interesting about that is they'll actually take that cup and they will put it in, in a, somewhere where no one's sitting and they'll go and they'll check the door to see if Elijah is there, to see if Elijah is now gonna come and restore all things. So this is something that still takes place today, which is pretty fascinating. They are still waiting and we should be waiting for the arrival of Elijah as well. But let's look at these last couple of verses and try to make some application today. Verse 34, it should come up for you. As he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my son, my chosen one, listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. 
Now, it says that when this cloud appears, now this is undoubtedly the Shekinah glory of God that is with them on that mountaintop. And all of a sudden, a voice speaks that says, this is my son. So not only do you have the two witnesses, the law and the prophets, Moses and Elijah, now you have the third witness, the very father himself testifying to who Jesus is, to the disciples. Now remember, it's these men who are gonna go on to lead the church. I, I don't know conclusively why God, why Jesus chose these three men for like, for instance, to watch what happened at the house of Jairus as he raised his daughter, why he allowed these three here on the Mount of Transfiguration or why these are the three that pray with him later in the Garden of Gethsemane. It could be because Peter was gonna go and be the leader for everything that happened afterwards. Or maybe John, because he was gonna be the one that pressed on longer and actually saw the risen Lord on the Isle of Patmos and wrote the book of Revelation. Maybe it was James because he was so close to death, because he was gonna be the first martyr of the church. We're not sure exactly why he chose these men, but what the Bible does tell us is that when they saw these things, it's not like they got a little frightened. It said they were terrified. All of a sudden, the holiness of God moves upon a mountaintop. You recognize yourself in light of who he is. This is the same thing that happened to Isaiah in Isaiah chapter six when he beheld the Lord, right? It says that he says, woe is me, I am undone. I am a man of clean, unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. In other words, the glory of the Lord begins to expose us for who we are and where we are. And church, that is the beautiful thing of getting with God in prayer. Because when he begins to reveal himself to you, when he shows up, man, it begins to show you just how unlike him you are and just how much beauty he has, how much holiness he has. And there's this desire that begins to well up in you that you wanna be like him. You wanna allow the spirit of God to begin to grow you to be like him. That is why prayer is so incredibly important to us. And then the voice comes. This is my chosen one. Listen to him. Now it says that Jesus, when he was coming down the mountain, commanded them to tell no one about this. And we talked about this a little bit before, why? You know, why would the Lord command? I can't even imagine trying to keep that secret in of what you just saw, right? Especially when the other disciples are still so brokenhearted because they know that Jesus is gonna suffer and die. You would think they'd wanna come down the mountain and say, you have no idea what I just saw but they have to keep silent. They have to keep silent until the time of his resurrection, why? Because it's at that point that they can no longer be silent because God has a mission for the church. And the disciples at this point, they would have had an incomplete message. Sure, they would have had the message that the Messiah has come, that he is God in the flesh, listen to him. But they had an incomplete message as well because they didn't understand fully at that point what the death and resurrection of Jesus is all about. We have this treasure. You and I, we understand it. We, we get what all of this was about. We look back in history upon a cross and it becomes a beautiful thing to us because it was where redemption happened for us. It was where unholy man became right with the holy God and got set on mission by this God. It wasn't as though God was gonna be the only one moving in this world. He's given us that opportunity to not just listen to him. But when that moment came, in the upper room and the church was born by the spirit of God, that we were no longer to be silent at that point, that we were to be a people that proclaimed the excellencies of our God, that we couldn't hold it in, that we had to tell people. In 2 Corinthians chapter four, verse three, it says this, because we have to ask the question, with this incredibly good news that we have, first of all, the understanding that fire is coming. This world is gonna pass away and it's gonna burn up. The judgment of God is coming upon this world. But the good news is that Jesus came for those who would come to him, for those who would trust him, for those who would give their life to him and follow him that we're saved from the wrath to come. And you would think with such good and beautiful and incredible news 
Who wouldn't receive this? But the Bible also tells us that men don't come to the light because they don't want the light. They like their deeds. They like their evil. And this is what Paul says about it in 2 Corinthians 4. He says, and even if our gospel, this good news that we're called to give, even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. And this morning, I, I was praying before anybody got here, and uh, man, there's, there's times every once in a while when the Lord just, kind of like the Mount of Transfiguration, he just pulls back the veil and I have this conversation with them. And every time that happens, he crushes my heart. It's not as though I don't enjoy the, the joy of my salvation. Oh, it was the most beautiful moment. But there's this transformative effect that begins to take place in your heart to where you begin to be crushed for the people that don't know God. I think a lot of times about this fact that most of the people that I know, most of them are gonna spend an eternity apart from Christ in hell. That's one of the hardest things that the Lord will drop on me from time to time. I'm not talking about just a passing understanding of it. I recently, there was, a, there was a girl that had came to the church a few times. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, I, I'd learned that she'd been in an automobile accident and died. And this is a girl that I'd been praying for and, and, and hoping that she would give her life to Christ. And it, I, I pray that that happened. I, I, don't, I don't know that it did or if it didn't, but it's almost overwhelming to me to think that that opportunity wasn't, that I, I wasn't there to be able to help in that transition, that she might very well spend an eternity apart from Christ. You know, there's, we have to think about this. We have to let the weight of this hit us as the people of God, as he perfects us in love, our hearts should go here. You know, there's, there's one day one specific day of the year that uh, we set up as a family. And it's, it's a different day probably every year. But um, we're, Cindy and I, Cindy had had a miscarriage um, between Allie and Lily. And uh, there's always a day that we set up in the year to where we, we write a letter to whether it's a, a son or a boy, we're not sure. We call, we call him Casey just because that's a good crossover name. But it's a day that I reflect on where he, he or she would be right now, the kind of relationship that I would have with him or her right now, the time missed. And um, it's a day of many, many, many tears. Um, and as hard as that is for me to walk through, as hard as it is for me to do, I, I wanna build a relationship with him here, you know? And, not just there, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna not be mindful of him, but it's good for me, as hard as that day is, to consider him or her, to think about him, to ask the Lord to tell him, you know, daddy's here and he loves you and I, I can't wait to see you. And I think that there is millions if not billions throughout the world that they won't see Christ. It's good for us to think about these things and to consider these things. Because if the work that Christ is producing in our heart is one of love for our neighbor, one for our fallen neighbor, there should be such a, a joy and love mixed with sorrow that when it combines within us, we can't be silent. We love because he first loved us. It is the call of Christ in your life to love them enough to let them know that there is a savior for them. Paul goes on and he says, 
even if our gospel is veiled. It's veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world, this is the first time Satan is called the God of this world. He says, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves. Our life is not to be about us. Our life isn't to be just, look at me, look at all the great things I get to do. What we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord. For God who said, let light shine out of the darkness. He takes us back to the very first chapter of Genesis. He says, the God who says, let light shine out of the darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And this is what they saw on that mountain. God's light has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And then he says this, you and I, we have this treasure in jars of clay. What's the treasure? That we know the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That we have the beauty of this gospel message that we want to give to the world and that we have a power within us placed there by God to go out into the world and to make disciples. We have this treasure in jars of clay. Why? To show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. One of the most magnificent places that you will connect with Christ and you will experience the joy, the love, the peace, and the power of his spirit is when all of a sudden we allow Christ to be seen through us. That as we go up the mountain, as we meet with him in prayer, do not neglect that, when we meet with him in prayer, it changes us. And that glow that we have like Moses had from glory to glory should be seen by everyone we cross paths with. Our life is not our own. We have been bought with a price. Let's glorify God in our bodies. Hebrews 12 verse 14 says that we should strive for peace with all people and holiness. In other words, becoming like God. Why? For without which, they won't see the Lord. No one will. Church, let's, let's let the power of this event. Peter, when he goes on to talk about this, he says, we didn't, we didn't follow cleverly, divine, or cleverly devised fables, but we were witnesses to his majesty on the holy mountain. We saw it. And we have the, more, the prophetic word more fully confirmed to us. How do we have that? Because his voice spoke upon the mountain. This is my son. Listen to him. May we be a church this morning that follows him. Let me pray for us. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you in humble gratitude, Father that we are saved, that we've been bought with a price. Lord, that though fire is coming to consume this world, Lord, you have loved us enough to send your son to die in our place, to walk the life that we could have never walked because God, you call us to perfection and we could never be perfect. But Lord, you've done that work for us and Lord, you said that anyone that would call to you, that anyone that would come to you, that profess that you are Lord, Lord, and that you rose again, that they would be saved. And Lord, you have called us to follow you. Lord, if there is anyone here this morning that has not understood the gospel, that, you are, that we are called to follow after you, Lord, and they wanna commit their lives to you today, Lord, I pray that they would simply say this to you right now, in their hearts. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. 
I know that because of that, hell awaits me. But Lord, I also know you weren't okay with this. That you became man. That you walked the life that I couldn't walk. You died the death that I deserved. And you rose again victorious over death and hell. And Lord, that you said that if I would follow you, that if I would confess that, that I would be saved. And Lord, I choose this morning to follow you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Perfect me in love. And give me purpose to go out and to proclaim your beauty, your glory, and the knowledge of the gospel. Lord, thank you that I'm saved. With every head bowed, if that was you this morning and you felt the need to call out to God and to ask him to save you, just make one more step of faith for me. Just raise your hand and let me know that. Say, Trent, that was me. I'm coming home. Father, thank you so much for the gospel. Thank you so much for life. We love you. We thank you so much. And we pray this morning in the name of Jesus, amen. So we have uh, prayer partners up here if you'd uh, like to uh, pray with someone this morning. And um, once again, for announcements, I wanna remind you to go ahead and sign up for the, the life group. And we're starting that a week from Thursday. And it's a, going to be at Christian Leon's place. And also as a reminder that uh, everybody that wants to have lunch with us, come over to our place. And uh, we should have seats for adults and then uh, children get to uh, exercise their creativity. A place to sit down and eat. So yeah, we, we'd love to have you. We're not, we don't have any schedule or anything like that. Just We don't even have any plans for the day. Just come over and uh, we'll enjoy the day, the day together. So uh, let's... Have a benediction. Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you and praise you. We thank you for your word uh, that it's opened to us so very clearly. We thank you for the truth of who Christ is. And uh, may the grace of Jesus Christ and the love of the Father and the blessed fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.